So when you think FX30, you think video camera. It's an incredible cinema camera in the cinema line and it takes obviously great videos. But what a lot of people don't know is it actually takes some pretty decent stills, 26 megapixel stills in this sensor. And the results were incredible when I actually went down to Gold Coast to photograph and film uh, some models down there. I had to do some social media content for them. And uh, obviously I did a lot of video with the FX30, but I also did some stills and it came out really good. But there are obviously a couple of cons with this when it comes to stills. So let's dive into some of the specs of the FX30 before we talk more about about this camera. So the FX30 is an APS-C style camera. It has a 26 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor. It has an ISO range of 100 to 32,000, 5.5 stops of IBIS, can shoot 14 bit raw stills, a three inch articulating touchscreen, has a maximum shutter of 1 8,000th of a second and a minimum shutter of 30 seconds. You are able to shoot 4K up to 120 frames per second with a crop or 4K 60 in the full sensor readout and 1080p at 240 frames per second. And it weighs a total of 646 grams and comes in an under 1800 US dollars. I'm very surprised about the stills capability of this camera because uh, I am now able to, you know, process the images in Lightroom because you can actually process the RAWs out of this camera now. And uh, I'm really, really impressed with the quality of the images. You probably wouldn't tell that it's from this camera. And being 26 megapixels, that's actually really solid when it comes to an APS-C sensor. Now we'll go through some of the pros of having this camera when it comes to photography. And that is being the sensor size the APS-C sensor. So if you are a wildlife photographer or a sports photographer, you're going to get extra reach right out of the bat, especially if you are using, well, pretty much if you're using any lenses, but I use a lot of full frame lenses on here. And uh, you're going to add 1.5 times onto that focal length. And essentially that gives you that full frame equivalent field of view. So if you've got a 50 millimeter lens, essentially it's a 75 millimeter lens on a full frame is what you're going to be seeing. So you're going to get extra range from all your your lenses, which is a really good thing, sports and wildlife. But there is a con with that when it comes to this. It only takes single shot stills. It doesn't have burst frame rate, which I don't know why. <laughs> they really just capped it at one frame and it does suck because if you're trying to track a subject, you actually have to keep hitting the button down and keep taking those frames. And obviously it's not as easy as literally just holding your finger down and just doing some bursts if you are doing sports and wildlife. So that could be the difference between getting the shot and not getting the shot. Now, once again, when it comes to being an APS-C sensor, you've got more lenses to choose from because you can use the APS-C lenses, but you can also use the full frame lenses as well, providing that they're Sony E-mount or adapted to Sony E-mount, which is really good. That opens you up to so many quality full frame lenses. This is the 85 f1.8. Uh, I've got the 35, I've got the 24, I've got larger 200 to 600 mil zoom, which works perfectly on here with, you know, surfing, wildlife, sports, all those kind of things. So it just gives you so much more lenses to use and pick from. Now, one of the biggest things when it comes to APS-C lenses is that they are generally smaller. And uh, this, this is actually probably a really bad example because this is the Sigma 16 mil, which is equivalent to the 24 mil. And it's actually about the same size. So that's a very bad example. But generally, APS-C lenses are actually smaller in build, mainly for the fact that they don't need as much optical glass inside the lens because the image circle is actually smaller. Obviously, you only need to cover an APS-C size sensor so you can actually get away with smaller lenses and that's pretty much the only reason for that. And obviously smaller lenses means it's just gonna be lighter, overall more compact. So when it comes to traveling and just obviously bringing this everywhere, it's going to be generally a little bit easier than full frame cameras. But these days, that's the cameras, but these days the camera sizes are very similar. The lens sizes are becoming pretty similar. It's much of a muchness really. It doesn't really make too much of a difference when it comes to the overall weight. But obviously one of the cons with that is that it is an APS-C sensor and your 1.4 lens isn't necessarily the same depth of field as you would get on a full frame. So an F1.4 actually ends up being about an F2.1 and that is for depth of field. The light transmission will still be an F1.4 or a T-stop, whatever the T-stop is, maybe a T1.5 or T1.6, depends on what light gets to the sensor. 
but the uh, depth of field is going to be different. It'll be 1.5 times 1.4, which is about 2.1. So that's the kind of depth of field you're going to get. So there is a little bit of a difference there, but there shouldn't be a deal breaker anyway when it comes to APS-C sensors, unless you are chasing that crazy shallow depth of field. And the four things that affect shallow depth of field is aperture, focal length, size of the sensor, and distance to the subject. But that will have to be a whole separate video talking about that. Now, and another con with this when it comes to stills is, obviously you can see, it's like the FX3, no EVF. And that can pretty much be a deal breaker for some people because I know a lot of people use the EVF for photography. Uh, me, myself, I am 50-50. Sometimes I'll use the EVF if it's too bright and I can't see the back of the screen or the back of the screen is perfect because if I need to get a low shot, I can sort of hang it down low and I don't physically have to get down low. But if you are an EVF photographer, you know, this doesn't have it. So that could be a deal breaker. Now, I guess one of the biggest downsides when it comes to photography is that it's an electronic shutter. So essentially, there is no shutter that goes in front. There is no front shutter. And uh, that could mean some pretty bad banding. And if you do shoot interior halls like basketball or indoor sports, you're going to notice banding. And that is unfortunate because of the lights will start to get these flickers and the readout. You'll see these really dark lines banding across the screen. And it's not great. It literally ruins shots. And unfortunately, electronic shutters do that. But there is a bit of a pro when it comes to electronic shutter, and that is silence. So you can put this on silent mode and essentially use it for wedding photography and you can't hear it, which is a great thing. And you can obviously use it for churches. You can use it for places that you need to be quiet and take photos. So yeah, that is a pro of the electronic shutter, but also obviously the con is that banding. Now, if you are actually a landscape photographer or a real estate photographer that actually needs photo bracketing, you can still do it in this one. If you don't know what photo bracketing is, essentially it just takes photos at three different exposures. You can merge them in and essentially just gives you more dynamic range, captures more in the shadows and it captures more in the highlights. And you can just get more, uh, I suppose, detail in the image which is really, really good for landscape photographers and extremely important when it comes to real estate photographers. And it also does have interval shooting as well, which is your regular time lapse. So you don't actually have to put it into S and Q mode, put it to one frame per second. You can actually do that within here into the settings and do a regular time lapse in there and get 26 megapixel stills and, and really high quality time lapse from this thing. And also because you do have IBIS inside here and you did want to slow your shutter speed right down, you're still going to get nice stable footage, which obviously is a really big pro with having IBIS inside the body is obviously you can slow that shutter speed down, get some nice light trails or just essentially get cleaner footage because you're able to slow it down and not bring up that ISO. I guess overall, when it comes to photography with this thing, it's gonna get you out of a pinch, especially if you are a videographer or a cinematographer and only want this camera for videos, you do have that option to still get 26 megapixel stills, which could be really good specifically for people who just literally wanna frame up a shot for one shot. Uh, product photography, you don't need to do burst rate. You can just get one single shot if you really need to. Uh, modeling and when it comes to portrait photography, sometimes a single shot shot is perfectly fine. All you need to do is literally frame it up, focus like normal, and then just take a still and just keep pressing the button however many times you need to get that shot. It's not an absolute deal breaker. So this could still really work for a lot of those people, but obviously there are a lot of people that don't like this and it probably won't work for you. Uh, and that's where Sony, hopefully, fingers crossed, 2023, they're gonna be bringing out an APS-C version of this when it comes to say the A6000 or the A7000, whatever they wanna call it in that kind of range. That's where you're gonna get 26 megapixels. That's when you're gonna get uh, really high burst rates and all those photo capabilities in the camera, but minus some of the video capabilities that you're going to get in the FX30. So yeah, anyway guys, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up, that'd be absolutely amazing. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, let's get it.